worship the Lord. Square Church this morning. We hope it's been a good morning so far. I know it can be a rustle and bustle sometimes in the midst of Sunday trying to get here and let's just take a moment, just a moment to settle our hearts this morning, kind of get present of where we are, where we are with the Lord, where we are with each other. Know that his grace and mercy is open for us this morning. And he wants us to abide in that this morning. And we are so excited. The team's been prepping for this week and excited for James, Pastor James, to bring the word this morning. And as we reflect on Christ and his resurrection and how we share in that, I think it's going to be a really powerful morning for all of us. So that is where we're headed this morning. So in that, we've chosen a new song this morning. It's called Praise the King. And we're going to teach the chorus here in just a minute. But it's amazing of how much just that abiding in Christ, how much that opens up between us. The peace, the love. And there are things in our lives right now 
that the Lord is wanting to resurrect. And so let that kind of be an open question for you this morning. Lord, what are you wanting to resurrect in me today? What is that that feels like death in my life and you want to breathe life over it? You want to breathe freedom. You want to breathe healing. So let's offer that to the Lord this morning. We're going to learn this song here. And the chorus goes like this. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He is alive. Praise the King.
worship you this morning. You are the risen king, and everything has changed because of that, Father. Thank you for your resurrection, your life, the promise of what is to come. We live in that truth, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's turn to one another and greet each other in love this morning. Thanks, you guys, for helping. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Canby Foursquare Church. It's so good to see you all this morning. What a beautiful day outside. Thanks for coming and sharing this time with us. You may be wondering why there's a television on the stage. Well, I'm not going to tell you. James will. It's all part of the mystery here. We're so happy that you're here with us. If you are new or visiting, I want to encourage you to fill out one of these welcome cards. And if you take that to the cafe, they'll give you a free beverage for this. So they've got some nice iced beverages today if you're in the mood for that. Also a reminder, if you didn't notice on your way in, that we got a new newsletter out. So grab one of those. If you are new or visiting, we're gonna be taking our offering in just a moment. And I just wanna make sure you feel comfortable and that you know, I, I, we don't want you to feel under any obligation. This is really something we do, um, those of us who call this their church home. So just be aware of that. We'll be taking our offering again in just a moment. And I was gone last weekend. I was visiting family in Nebraska. Google Nebraska. It's pretty awesome. I didn't know. Um, but <laughs> I know. I didn't know. Um, so it, it just made me think about this weekend being Memorial Day weekend. A lot of people spend time with friends and family. And it made me think of you guys and how you are really your family here and your friends and family. And, and I just want to thank you for your generous hearts and how much we all come together both in the giving that we're about to do right now, but also in volunteering. We're going to celebrate you next week, all the volunteers. And just thank you for that. Thank you for how much you have made this place feel like a home and a family. I appreciate that. Let's invite the ushers forward as we pray. Lord, I am so grateful for this family that we call Canby Four Square, and thank you for the people here, the individuals that make up this family. Lord, I pray a blessing on the offering that they give today, that we all give, Lord, and we pray that it is used for your kingdom and for your glory. In your name we pray, amen. Hey everybody, welcome to this Memorial Day weekend service. We are so glad to have you. Uh, as you can see, Annette and I aren't with you this morning. We're actually up in Seattle with some of the rest of our team. Uh, we're enjoying and being part of the Foursquare connection that goes on uh, every year. It's an international connection where people come from all over the world and we spend time together, three or four days. Uh, in fact, this time we're going to be there. We're bringing back with us to Canby, Oregon, the leaders of Albania Foursquare Church. They're going to be with us. You'll get to see them, meet them. Uh, we're just having a great time hosting them. And so we just want you to know where we are this weekend. Be praying for us. This is really a crucial time for, uh, for us uh, to be refreshed and also for our denomination to, to experience the things that God has for us. Now, let me lead you right in to our weekend announcements. Our first announcement is we have a volunteer appreciation week, and actually it's next Sunday, June 3rd, and we want to invite all of you to be part of that. Listen, 
Uh, we are so thankful. I am deeply thankful uh, for the volunteers here at Canby Four Square Church. The amazing amount of work that you get done in this church, in this community, around the world, the resources that you provide, it's incredible. Uh, and we just have a very small way of saying thank you. We're going to do it with a donut wall. I know that's not a whole lot, but it's something. We want you to come and get a donut and hang out and talk. Annette and I want to spend some time with you as well. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday, our Volunteer Appreciation Sunday. Hope we get to see you there. Don't want you to forget about VBS. It's coming soon. And this has really been a, a, a long-standing, uh, I, I want to say tradition, but it's even more than that because it's reaching into community, uh, reaching into our church family, and bringing our kids together so they can hear the stories of Jesus Christ. They can hear the stories of how great God is. And every time we do this, there's just an encouragement that comes to the community. There's a place in the book of Acts that says, and joy was in the community. Anytime we do a VBS, that's exactly the way I feel when I see all the kids on the campus. I think, what great joy. Uh, what a, a great way to celebrate God's love than to bring hundreds of kids on this campus and continue to teach them about Jesus Christ and God's love for them. We want you to be part of that. Invite folks. Invite families. We just, uh, we just want to do a great thing and be, be part of what God's up to in our community. I want to also let you know about Youth Camp coming up this summer. Annette and I are just so passionate about our kids going to camp. Uh, Annette and I went to camp growing up, and that's where God called us to serve Him. God does some amazing things when we take the time and the resources to let our kids get away, hear from other great godly people and godly leaders, let them be influenced by those folks, and watch what happens because God will move in their heart. When they come back, they're changed, they're different, and that's what we expect to take place. We really believe in this next generation, and one of the, one of the greatest influences in their life is the opportunity you have to send your kids to camp. So we want you to do that. I know there's some uh, scholarships available. There are a lot of things going on. Our kids are raising some funds. We're serious about this, and we want uh, to see your kids there. So sign up as soon as you can, and God bless you. Now is time in the service when I get to introduce to you Pastor James Walton. Uh, just really appreciate James and Courtney and the boys. Uh, we're just in love with them, and I'm thankful for what God is doing in that family and how God's using James as the dean of Canby Bible College. Wonderful things are taking place. So open your hearts, open your minds. The series is Risen, and listen to what James has to say from God's Word on Risen, and that's life after the resurrection, how we are changed and transformed by Jesus Christ. Pastor James, it is yours. Go for it. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ron. Hey friends, welcome to church. So good to have you guys here. Uh, I'm James, like Ron mentioned. Uh, let me give you a little insight. Every sermon that I preach, I, I hate every sermon until I get a chance to preach it. And I, I, like, there's a deep discomfort that I get when I sit in my office all week and I write this stuff out and I come up here with like 10 or 12 pages of notes and every time I'm like, I don't like it. And last night around 6 o'clock, I was sitting at my house and I was like, I really don't like this one. And I realized that what I was trying to do was too much. And so I texted Ron and Dave, because Dave's scheduled to preach next weekend, and I'm like, guys, um, do you mind if we make this a two-part thing? And I cut my sermon in half and just do the part that I think is really helpful here and then save the second half for next week? And they said yes. So, um, so that's pretty cool. So you're going to get me this week and next, and uh, hopefully um, it'll, it'll be worthwhile. And I'm, uh, I'm excited about that. We're going to be, in both weeks, looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, where Paul is dealing with the topic of the resurrection. So that's what we're going to talk about today, risen, which is life after the resurrection. We're continuing this um, here. Um, I'm so grateful for you guys. Happy Memorial Day weekend. I um, hope that you guys have a wonderful time of rest in the next 48 hours or so. Um, and continue to pray for us and Ron, and we're all up at that conference this week as well. Okay, um, so 1 Corinthians 15, risen, life after the resurrection. I want to, this chapter right here is like, abs it's, 
If you look at everything that Paul ever wrote, this chapter right here is actually the longest single thought on any given topic that Paul has anywhere in his writing. And so we're going to take the next two weeks to look at it. There's a lot to cover. So as always, let's go ahead and pray. We'll get into uh, the big idea and then open the text, all right? Jesus, uh, we believe that you are wonderful and you are great. And we are grateful that you uh, have called us your people and that you have saved us by your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, we are hopeful that your resurrection means life to come for our mortal bodies and an eternity spent in friendship with you. Lord, help me to speak clearly and for Scripture to work within us, and in your name we pray, amen. All right, Uh, the big idea, as always, I try to put things in a little nutshell for you guys, and this week it's this, the resurrection of Jesus is important. Next week when we get here, we'll learn about how the resurrection of Jesus has implications, all right? So the resurrection of Jesus is important important, right? That's the first thing. But I want to take us one layer deeper into this and to help you guys understand that the resurrection of Jesus is important because. It's important because without it, our faith in Christ and our work in the world is worthless. That's the big point that Paul is trying to communicate in the first half of 1 Corinthians 15. So let's get into the text to see how uh, Paul unpacks all of this. If you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Corinthians 15. If you don't, there should be a blue Bible in the seats nearby, or you can look it up on your app on your phone. If you don't have a Bible at all, please feel free to take one of those Bibles that's in the seats underneath you. That's our gift to you. We believe that reading the Bible every day blesses your life. Okay, a little bit of context here. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is concluding this really lengthy letter to this church in Corinth. Corinth is located on the east side of modern-day Greece. And if you think about uh, the closest parallel might be something like Cancun on spring break. Like Corinth was just filled with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And Paul's early Christian community that he founded there, the church that was there, was constantly struggling to conform to the attitudes and behaviors of Corinth, and Paul sends this letter, which is part rebuke and part teaching, to help this early church look and smell and behave more like Jesus. It's a beautiful letter, and then 1 Corinthians 15 is one of his final thoughts. We're going to jump in in verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. This is the heartbeat of Paul's proclamation of the gospel. If you were to pinch Paul down and say, Paul, what is the essence, the core of your message? He would say this, that Christ died for our sins. And not only that, he was buried and that he was resurrected on the third day. And did you notice this little note? Twice he mentions that all of this is done in accordance with the Scriptures. And in particular, Paul here is probably thinking about places in the Old Testament like Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53. But more broadly than that, Paul as a Jew steeped in the Old Testament and the stories that God has been telling through all of the great characters understands that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises. The culmination of every big story is now found in Jesus. So what Jesus did on the cross isn't something new as though the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are somehow divided. Not at all. But rather, God has done in Jesus exactly what he said he would do in centuries past. He is faithful to his promises. Let's keep reading in verse 5. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Paul here mentions folks who have witnessed the resurrection of Jesus personally. Look back here. Cephas is Peter. Peter, the man who denied Jesus three times, but would later be restored and be established as one of the pillars in the early church. Uh, And then to the 12, although you could split hairs here with Paul and say technically there was 11 because Judas, you know, had kind of hung himself by this point. Sad story about Judas. If only he had waited 
to see the resurrected Jesus. Anyway, sad guy. Uh, then he appears to more than 500 brothers at one time. I love this note. Paul's like, hey, actually, uh, some of them have fallen asleep, which is an ancient biblical euphemism for being dead in the same way we might say so-and-so passed away as a way to soften the fact that they died. Well, they would say they'd fallen asleep. Well, that means that 500 people had seen Jesus at one time. And in fact, if you're curious, a lot of those guys are still alive now 30 years after the resurrection, which is when this book was written. You can go and talk to him if you've got any questions. Oh, and then he appears to James, uh, who's the brother of Jesus, an early pillar of the church in Jerusalem, and then to the rest of the apostles. In other words, there's a long list of witnesses who have seen Jesus alive. And not only that, He appeared to me as to one untimely born. He appeared also to me, Paul, for I am the least of the apostles unworthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I love this, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. Here, Paul, he actually defends his ministry by saying that even though he wasn't there for the origin, for that um, Uh, For all of those sightings with the 500, Jesus actually also appeared to him. You can look it up, I think it's Acts chapter 8 or 9, when Paul, then Saul, was riding a donkey to the city of Damascus. Do you guys remember this story? So Saul was this, Saul's a very fascinating character. Anyway, he's, he's going to Damascus to go round up some early Christ followers and throw them in jail, and Jesus shows up in a blinding light, knocks him off his donkey, asks him why he's persecuting him, and then Saul has this magnificent transformative change. It's the only thing that it describes or explains the power of what happened to Paul is that Jesus actually appeared to him. So one quick note here from Paul's life. You're not beyond the reach of God's grace. Now, sometimes when we say that, that's a beautiful truth. You're not beyond the reach of God's grace. No matter where you're at in the world, you can recognize that God hasn't left you. He's there. He's a patient. He's a good father. He's forgiving. He's slow to anger. He's long-suffering. He's full of compassion and love. You're not beyond the reach of God's grace. But sometimes when we hear these stories, You might be thinking about somebody you know who had, like the early Corinthians, made shipwreck of their lives through sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and they'd made a whole bunch of choices, and now they're just like, they bought a house on Struggle Street, and they're living there, and life is hard. And then, suddenly, they find Jesus, and then their life gets transformed, and this is great, and we celebrate that. I was having coffee with a CBC student, a former CBC student, just on Friday. This guy, fascinating character, was like... Dealing drugs and stealing cars in California 10 years ago, ended up at the bottom, finds Jesus, and is now like a very successful in his enterprise, leading small groups, studying the Word of God, preaching on Sundays. Like God totally transformed his life. And we celebrate that. But I don't want our imagination to be closed around the idea that God's grace only extends to people who, through their own misbehavior, had made a mess of things. Think about Paul himself. Who was Paul? Well, Paul comes from this very devout Jewish family. His dad worked in the trades, had a small business. They had enough to send their son to the finest finishing school in Jerusalem. So I'm thinking middle, upper middle class. That's the kind of people that Paul comes from. This man was blindingly intelligent. He was driven beyond anything that you've ever seen, and he was the straightest arrow of the bunch. Ask anybody who the best person most likely to succeed would be, they would all point straight at Paul. And this was before he met Jesus. He was successful, he was intelligent, he was driven. And yet Paul says, I was the least of all of these. I think that the people who are most in danger of rejecting the grace of God are those who are competent, intelligent, and successful. Um, So up until that Damascus Road experience when Jesus shows up and knocks Paul off his horse, he had missed it entirely. All of his smarts, all of his studies, all of his hustle, all of his do-goodness, it meant nothing 
because he hadn't encountered Jesus and he wasn't trusting Jesus. And frankly, this is a challenge for me because I haven't made shipwreck of my life by the grace of God yet. And so do I only trust Jesus when things are bad and I've got no other options? Or do I still trust Jesus when through, by my own smarts and intelligence and hustle, things are going pretty good? Do you see the challenge, the danger that's subtly hidden when things go well? Is that you'll end up being like... (sighs) Look at what I've done. And self-sufficiency and pride creeps in. I grew up in Homer, Alaska. Homer, Alaska is a funny little town. If you're not careful, when the winters are so dark and long, you'll end up drinking and doing drugs. And I had a family member who did that. And I thought, well, that's a good example. I'll do what they don't do. So I was always the good kid. The worst thing I did in high school was my senior year. Uh, it, was, it was December 21st, the longest day of the year, and solstice is a big deal up in Alaska because the sun comes up at 10, says nah, and then goes back down around 2. <laughs> so by the time school let out at 3, it was dark. Around noon that day, a buddy of mine, Scott, and I come up with this idea that we're going to hitchhike up to Anchorage, which is like five hours north, because I will leave out some of the details here. We wanted to go snowboarding that weekend, but neither one of us had a car. And so we decided to go snowboarding. And so to get there, we needed to hitchhike. And so we gather up all of our gear and we're like, we're not stupid. So we're going to bring like sleeping bags and tents in case we don't get a ride so that we can like camp in the snow and not die. And so we're walking along in the middle of the night, which is four in the afternoon. And (laughs) along this dark road, this storm is starting to come in. It's snowing heavily. And there's no shoulder because when they plow the roads, they only plow between the stripes, right? And so every time a car would come by, we'd have to like really squeeze up against the berm on the ditch. Anyway, finally, this is this the dumbest idea that you've ever heard, I know. But like you've got to understand, for 18-year-old boys, the prefrontal cortex, this part up here that like occupies like sound decision making, that doesn't get developed until you're like 25, so you'll have to forgive me. So we made this really dumb choice, but the end of it all is that we made it to Anchorage by the grace of God, but the problem was we hadn't thought through where we were going to stay in Anchorage. We had no, we, we had, and this is 2001 before cell phones were a thing, so we had no way to get a hold of anybody and no real place to stay until I realized that the academic decathlon team was staying in a hotel in Anchorage, and we had buddies on, I should have been on that team, but instead, no, I was hitchhiking to the hotel where this group was staying, so we walk up to the concierge desk, and we're like, hey, we're looking for so-and-so, and they're like, we can't tell you where they're staying, what room they're in. Like, okay, that kind of makes sense. So now we can't, find, we can't find these people. We need to get in the hotel room. We don't have a place to stay. So our, our next thought was we'll just start walking down the hallways. Two boys with winter backpacks on and snowboards sticking out, just walking up and down the hallways of like the Holiday Inn Express looking for our friends, and we bump into them. Ha ha, this is great. This plan is working out perfectly so far. Like nothing could go wrong, right? So we spend the next 12 hours hiding from all the chaperones who know we're not supposed to be on the trip. The end of the story, I'm leaving out the part where a car or a tree falls on somebody's car and there's another auto accident, but the point is we get home at the end of the weekend and on Monday morning I get called into the vice principal's office. And if you know anything about me, I am not the kind of guy, I am terrified of authority figures as a child because I want to be known as a good kid. I was a good kid. And if you're a good kid, the worst thing that can happen to you is to be a bad kid. And so you work very hard to not be caught being a bad kid. So somehow somebody figured out that Scotty and I had snuck into this hotel. And so the vice principal calls me down and I've got to face the vice principal. And she says to me, I'm going to charge you for the cost of a room at the Holiday Inn Express because you stayed there. And I said, you can't do that. And this was a big deal. I was talking back to an authority figure. I said, there were only three people in that room and I made the fourth. The occupancy limit on a hotel room is four people. There were two queen beds. It was perfectly legitimate for me to be there. You can't do anything about this. She looked at me and then let me go. (laughs) I was so proud of myself. The problem is when you're a kid like me is that if you're super good all the time and you know that you're good, and especially if you've got a sibling who's kind of the black sheep, then the contrast is what you really care about. They're bad, so I'll be good. But do you know what happens when you try to be good all the time? Two things. One, 
you fail, and then you feel super guilty because your identity is wrapped up in being a good kid. Or two, you succeed, which is even worse, because now suddenly you're proud. You're self-sufficient. You're arrogant. And you don't need Jesus. Why? Because you can make good choices all on your own. Think about Jesus for a second in the Gospels. He frequently interacted with two types of people, prostitutes and Pharisees. Okay? Now, prostitutes don't need a ton of explanation, so let's talk about the Pharisees. Pharisees were a group of the religious elites in Jesus' day. They were the self-proclaimed keepers of the flame. They were the ones who were going to keep the people on the straight and narrow. They were the ones who had codified all of the ways that you needed, of things you needed to do in order to be a good God follower. You looked at, you want these people to be their neighbor, your neighbor. They would keep their yard mowed just fine. They would keep the toys out of the front. They'd be pleasant people. But do you know who Jesus said was furthest from the kingdom of God between the prostitutes and the Pharisees? It wasn't the prostitutes, and it wasn't the tax collectors, and it wasn't the sinners, and it wasn't the lepers, and it wasn't the outcasts, and it wasn't the people who society had shunned and given up on. It was the self-righteous, proud Pharisees. That's who Jesus says has a more difficult time entering the kingdom of God. Why? Because at least the people over here knew that they needed help. And sometimes when you get successful and competent and intelligent, you think that you don't need help anymore. And so you don't depend on Jesus. Remember the rich young ruler? I really like this picture. In Luke chapter 18, this really wealthy guy comes up to Jesus and asks this, like, I mean, just the perfect evangelistic question. He says, good teacher, what must I do To be saved. I mean, imagine you as a Christian. Somebody comes up to you and says, I want to get saved. How do I do it? I hope you have an answer to that. Right? Oh, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, good. What did Jesus himself say when someone said, how do I get eternal life? The young man had said, all the commandments of the Bible I have kept without blemish from my youth. Ladies, pay attention. Here's a man with tons of money and no skeletons in the closet. Are we on the right track? Jesus says, no. He looks this young man up and down, and you know what he tells him to do? He doesn't say, oh, believe in me. He says, no, I want you to go sell everything that you have, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. Now, what? I could have sworn that I was saved by grace and faith, not by works, and yet Jesus, in response to a question about how he gets saved, tells this young man to do something. Uh, What? And here's why. Because Jesus understood something about this young man's heart. Inside this young man's heart was a little God that he was serving. It was called money. And right next to it was its twin brother, morality. I'm really rich, and I've kept all the commandments. And Jesus says, in order for you to actually come and follow me, to experience a new kind of life, do you know what you'll have to do? You'll have to kick off and kick out those two little false gods that you're serving right now in order for me to take the place of sitting on the throne of your life. Because I guarantee you, for all of us, we all suffer from small amounts of idolatry where we want to serve other things. And for successful, competent, intelligent people, it's often their own status as really good people. That was this guy's problem. And what Jesus told him was, Now, the way to eternal life is not self-enforced poverty. He told it to this guy, not to every rich person in the world. But the danger with wealth and status and intelligence and competence and success is that you end up thinking that those are the things that will save you. And Jesus comes in and says, actually, if you want the way of eternal life, you'll have to kick those false gods off the throne of your life in order to invite me in. Jesus doesn't do half measures. He's not content to share the throne. So, who's beyond the reach of God's grace? Frankly, the proud people. 
people like me. And it's a fight that I have every day to keep humbling myself, to keep trusting Jesus. And you know what? Like Paul, I can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And every day, that's my only strategy. I think a lot about how to finish well. I'm 34. Let's say I got another 30 years in this game. You don't wander into finishing well. You don't drift that direction. The enemy comes after you. Not just pastors, anybody. So I'm trying to figure out what practices do I put in my life now to not make shipwreck of my life and my family and my career and bring, and bring shame to the name of Christ later. The only strategy I'm working with now is to wake up every day and say that prayer that that sinner did. Remember that guy? So a Pharisee and a sinner go to the temple to pray. The Pharisee's like, mm, God, so good, so good. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not like that other dude. Sinner, thanks for making me like me. We're in it. Good job. And the sinner, he stands afar off. His head is down. And he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus tells that story to tell you, you've got two options in life. You can be the Pharisee. It's all about me. I'm so good. God, you're so lucky to have me. Or you can just say, you know what? I'm going to choose the low road. So that's my strategy, choosing the low road. Let's get back to the text. So Paul has just spent a couple of verses telling us about the nature of the resurrection. He says that it centers on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's the heart of the gospel. And then, like a good pastor, Paul is going to confront a false teaching that's present in the church in Corinth. The false teaching is that there's no resurrection from the dead. Watch what he does here. I find this so fascinating. Paul, excellent, excellent writer. He launches into a series of arguments about the resurrection using if-then logic statements. Verse 12, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then your preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So there are two nested if-then arguments that are present here that are going to debunk this false teaching. First, Paul says, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then, by definition, not even Christ has been raised. That follows, right? If there's not a category that allows for people to get resurrected, then Jesus, no matter what else we might think about him, doesn't fit into that category. That kind of stuff just doesn't happen. But Paul says, if you follow this out, well, then let's make this. If Christ has not been raised, then what happens? Then he says, our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. Why? What makes the resurrection so central? Um, I, I hate to reference you to a class at CBC, but this is kind of a big topic. I'll try to condense it down for you here. There's two places I want to point to. First, in Romans uh, chapter 1, by the Paul describes Jesus as being declared to be the Son of God in power because of the resurrection. That is, that because Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, that was God's stamp of approval for everything that Jesus was and claimed to be. Absent the resurrection, then he's just another dead peasant. Okay? Also in 1 Corinthians 15, a little bit later in the chapter, right, Paul, or Christ defeats death through the resurrection. Death is the final enemy. And Jesus at Calvary, and then on Easter morning, defeats death. He rises again. Notice, never to die again. Lazarus and everybody else who was raised to life back throughout the Bible, they all died again. But Jesus is unique. And so if we don't trust in an eternal, immortal, ongoing Savior, then who are we trusting in? Certainly not someone who can save us, therefore our faith is in vain. Paul will continue working backwards this time, first stating the effect, the then, and then the cause, the if. He says, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Paul's repeating himself for emphasis. And if Christ has not been raised, 
Your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. So let's look at it again. If the dead are not raised, that's the if statement, then we are misrepresenting God because we're saying something that didn't actually happen. Our gospel proclamation, everything that we're doing out here, risking our lives over land and sea to proclaim the gospel to you is an absolute farce because it's not based in reality. And not only that, but your faith is futile and you are still in your sins because Jesus being resurrected means that he was vindicated before the Father and the sacrifice of what he did on the cross now applies not just to him, but to everyone who has faith in his work. If Jesus wasn't raised, it means that he died for his own sins, but not for the sins of anyone else. And so now the resurrection is our trust, our hope, our confidence that Christ's work on the cross is sufficient. All right. Um, next verse, verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, now, if in Christ we have this, if we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Again, Paul keeps pressing. If the resurrection didn't happen, then there is no hope for dead saints. This last Sunday, we were down at my wife's grandfather's memorial service. He died at the wonderful age of 90, surrounded by family and friends. And my kids, who are six and seven, this is their first death. And what was so fascinating is to have them understand that Grandpa Harold, great Grandpa Harold, who they loved, that they would be able to see again. Absent the resurrection, there's no hope. Those who have died in Christ before his return, they simply return back to dust. But the central Christian hope is that there is more than just this life only, including being reunited with dead saints. And not only that, if the resurrection didn't happen, then Christians, frankly, are to be pitied more than any other people. I like this. Paul is so confident in the resurrection of Christ that he says, look, if I'm wrong on this, then there's nobody who's got it worse because I've staked everything that I have, all of my hopes, all of my future is in this one historical reality. And if it's not true, then what am I even doing out here risking my life for you all to proclaim a message that is in fact a lie? Most to be pitied. The Corinthians, remember, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, they were caught up in this, it's still around, it's called hedonism. Hedonism is summed up in the phrase, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And if this life is the only life that you have, then one of the logical things that you can arrive at is to say, I will suck all of the pleasure that I can get out of this life and leave my body a wasted shell by the end of it because I lived, right? And Christians say, let us eat, drink, and be merry because we serve one who will make us alive for eternity that we're living not just for this life only, but we are living for far greater joys that is found in friendship in the presence of God when he comes to rule and reign. All right, so all that to say is the resurrection is important. Literally, you take this piece out of the Jenga stack, the whole thing collapses. It is the... It is, it is the keystone in the archway of the bridge. It is the foundation stone of the entire building. There, you, you do not arrive at Christianity without the resurrection of Christ. You get something, but it's not Christian. All right. But like I said before, we don't really have a category for this, right? If you were to talk to most people, you say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in the resurrection. They're like, hmm, fascinating. That's cool. I believe in science. Because dead people don't come back to life, right? Now, um, actually, a buddy of mine did. Um, he's, he's at the beach this week, and he attends church here. He had a massive heart attack at, in his early 40s and died. He was just gone. Five minutes, maybe seven minutes, heart not beating. Paramedics come, resuscitate him, kaboom, he's back. He's doing great. <laughs> Wild. That's so cool, Right? What happened to Jesus isn't that. That's resuscitation. 
Jesus got resurrected, okay? I want to make sure we're clear on that, right? And not just resurrected, but resurrected never to die again. Lazarus, the widow of Nain's son, there's one other in the Gospels, there's a bunch more in the Old Testament. They all died and they came back, but they died again. Jesus was different. Jesus died, and when he came back, he came back in a new body, not subject to corruption and decay. He is now immortal and eternal, okay? Paul includes, way back in verse 3, that note about Jesus being buried for three days. That's really kind of important because that helps us understand this wasn't just a kind of like, oh, Jesus was really feeling badly. They thought he died, and then he got better again. No, Jesus was really and actually dead. Make sure we're clear on that. Jesus was really and actually dead. But some attempts have been made to try to make this idea of a really and actually dead person coming back to life. I'll give you a couple of them here. One alternative is that what happened on Easter morning, that Jesus wasn't actually dead when they took him off the cross, right? He was really beat up, but he had swooned and passed out on the cross, and they thought he was dead. And then they put him in the tomb, in the cool air of the tomb revived him and then he was able i'm not sure how they get around the whole like massive stone rolled in front he was able to anyway it kind of breaks down in part because one it's completely disrespectful to the romans and if you know anything about the ancient romans they were really good at one thing killing people they were just they had perfected it like crucifixion a distinctly roman invention right is one of the most horrific ways to die and trust me they had done it tens of thousands of times the roman centurion who had overseen hundreds of crucifixions knew what a dead man looked like jabs his spear into the side of jesus blood and water flow the man knew that jesus was dead everybody gathered around knew that jesus was dead they put him in the tomb as a dead man he was really and actually dead. Well, maybe actually what happened is that Jesus died, but instead of being physically resurrected, the early observers at the tomb, what they had was this kind of like um, mass hallucination. They desired so strongly to see the resurrected Jesus that they just projected this experience into their mind, and they went and told everybody else about what they had seen. And this too, it maybe is feasible, except you have to remember that there was no category in early Judaism for the resurrection of someone like this. It wasn't even, it was, they they had no framework to think that this was even, it wasn't even a hope of theirs. Remember Peter? Peter, the man who denied Jesus three times, one of Jesus' closest disciples. You know what his next move was after the resurrection? I'm going to go fishing. (laughs) Just, he was moving on with his life. He was going back to what he did before he met Jesus. Like, well, that was a waste three years down the dang it, right? He, he wasn't expecting to see Jesus. People, he's not, he's not waking up today, I'm going to have a fever dream, and I'm going to see Jesus, and then my life is going to be radically transformed. I think the only reasonable explanation to describe, one, the power of the early witnesses and their evangelistic call, and the power and the spread and the sustainability of early Christianity inside of a pagan empire can only be explained if what happened on Easter Sunday was a real resurrected Jesus. And some of you that may not be convincing, I brought this book by N.T. Wright. It's 800 pages. It's called The Resurrection of the Son of God. It's a fascinating work. I um, encourage you to look into it. So much rides on the resurrection that to dismiss it or to think, well, I, I'm, I don't, my worldview does not allow for this kind of thing to happen. And I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and see all of the things that hinge upon this being a reality. So, let's conclude by doing this. If the resurrection actually happened, then Paul's right. Then what Jesus did on Easter morning really is transformational. And it means that Jesus' works on the cross is finished. Friends, I have no other hope, I have no other confidence, I have no other trust than Jesus taking all of my pride, my self-righteousness, and my self-sufficiency and saying, James, I'll die for that too. And I'll give you the new life that only comes through me. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then he just died in his own sins and it doesn't matter. But we serve a risen Jesus. We serve a resurrected Jesus. And it is so crucially important 
that we trust that on an ongoing basis because the, the, the Jesus who walked out of the tomb on Easter morning is still the same Jesus who has promised to abide with us every single day through the Holy Spirit. And the power that was present in the life of Christ to resurrect him back from the grave, the Bible says, is also present in us. So the resurrection is important, not just as a theological thing that I want you to make sure we're all on the same page on. No, it's a living and daily trust in the one who has laid his life down for us. And we're in response, we gratefully, gladly, joyfully put our trust in him, knowing that our hope is secure that our eternal future with him is caught up into his loving hands and our work today is not done in vain. Why? Because he superintends and guides us through the work of the Holy Spirit. The resurrection is important. Jesus' work on the cross is finished. And I want us, especially on a long weekend, to rest. To rest in the trust that what Jesus has done is sufficient. Let's pray. Lord, we love you with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. And God, I, I just repent again of my pride, of my self-sufficiency. Lord, help me daily to trust you. Help me daily to fall into the arms of your grace. Help me daily to have hope and joy that because of your resurrection, I have a future. Lord, let, let us as a people live within that reality and let us rest knowing that you're in control and that you are powerful and that you are king. We love you, Jesus. We're grateful. In your name we pray. Amen.